What's going on, folks? It's your boy again, back in the building. Dr. Sean Thomas here, episode 56 of the Be More Today show. We are back, we are back, we are back in the building. And folks, like I said before, it is springtime. It is nice outside. We're happy to be here, happy to be alive, doing well. And the Be More Today show continues to move and group and grow. Thank you so much for your support. We are now in 34 countries uh, across the world, and we're, we're trending. We're trending now, bringing you guys great content. Again, ordinary people doing extraordinary things every single Monday. Thank you so much for your support. We've been having a lot of followers, a lot of support on Instagram and on Facebook. Uh, if you are following us, please go on and subscribe to our pages. Be more today. It's on Facebook and Instagram and on Twitter as well. And continue to be a part of the movement, us trying to get out there and just be better people. My quotation for today is simple as always. And it says, make the most of yourself by fanning the tiny inner sparks of possibility into flames of achievement. Folks, this has been a time where uh, I've seen a lot of people go out there and make nothing, uh, make great things out of nothing. Um, They've taken their time and they've used their talents in various ways. Um, If the one thing that we learned from this year and last year is that you can do anything you put your mind to it. There's been people who started businesses out of COVID-19, uh, who changed jobs out of COVID-19, uh, changed professions, uh, uh, moved into houses, uh, moved to different states. Um, the human spirit is so resilient and we're so creative in how we do certain things. Um, and I think just little sparks, right? Any idea you may have, write that thing down. Uh, anything you may have in your mind that you say, you know what, I want to do this, but you don't have the, the tact or the, the follow through or the ideas to see, see it through. Write that stuff down because those are seeds that you're going to plant for something bigger. And sometimes it just takes a little more water on that plant to get you to do some great things. And who knows where that plant can take you, where that plant can grow, where it can prosper. Um, I'm really excited to see the growth that we're going to continue to see as as a people. Um, Even myself uh, this year, you know, we're doing bigger things to be more today than I thought we could ever do in in the beginning. So uh, and they all came from little things, little things that became bigger things. Um, Like I said in my book, everything is a seed that can be planted and and watered. And it just takes these steps, these steps to greatness. I talk about my book, right? Little steps, little baby steps to get you from one place to the other. And then by the time you look back and you see, wow, I did all that stuff, you know? And I think a lot of people get get, um, thrown off by the process, right? They they get worn down by the process because sometimes it takes patience. Sometimes it takes time, but really putting that grind into it, you will see you too can be successful. And my guest for today, folks, embodies that. He is one of my oldest friends, um, one of my oldest friends all the way back from sixth grade, if you believe it or not. Uh, his name is Diego Cepeda. And for nearly 40 years of experience, Diego Cepeda has led a life of constant adventure. He holds four nationalities all in one body, uh, two of them North America and two South America. He has lived all over the place between way of Canada, or Canada, Canada, <laughs> Canada, the real OC, Orange County, you know, upstate New York, Memphis, Michigan, Chicago, and Texas. It was during his middle school days that Diego befriended your boy, Sean Thomas, and had to settle on being, as he said, not me, the second best athlete, the second best leader, and the second best dancer on the floor. The friendship has continued for about 30 years. Uh, which seems to be a really long time to have a friend. And it's true. As a kid, he had visions of being an anthropologist, an architect, an astronaut, chemical engineer, and finally settled on hotel management by the time he graduated high school in Memphis, Tennessee. To learn the ropes of the hospitality industry, Diego attended Michigan State University, learned what good basketball and hockey looked like, and post-graduation went to start his career in Chicago. Diego spent a nib of above nine years in Chi-Town mastering the world of food, starting with working as a room service manager, serving celebrities at a high-ranked hospital, the Peninsula, Chicago, followed by being the head restaurant manager on a dining cruise ship. And then during the recession, transitioning to doing market re- research for the food industry while searching and starting a European bakery with a truly unique French chef. Towards the end of three years of operating the bakery, Diego wrote a movie script about the stress days as an entrepreneur intermingled with the chef's unbelievable life happenings. And after selling his interests, Diego pursued business school. Diego had decided enough of an agitated hustling life and time to go back to school to mastering marketing. Diego arrived in Ann Arbor, Michigan in August 2012 as the start of life changing experience at the University of Michigan, where he pursued an MBA. Two years after gallivanting through international parties, 
studying at the wee hours of the night at the dead <laughs> silent law library and working in a casino in Santiago, Chile and recruiting Diego landed a marketing role at Dell Technologies in Austin, Texas. At Dell, Diego met his wife, Tong Zhang, and they live a happy Texan life with the mini <laughs> Don Cheng baby. For the last seven years, Diego has hopped around from Dell to a few other software companies, delving into all corners of marketing, and now is happily a product marketing at Snow Software. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, pets included, please welcome to the Be More Today Show, episode 56, my boy, my longtime friend, Diego Cepeda. Diego, what is going on? Hey, Sean. Th thanks so much for having me having me part of this uh, show. I think it's really incredible, everything you've put together. I'm surprised it's already at 56 uh, shows, and it's an honor uh, to be one of your guests. I see, you know, uh, the, the other people that have been there on Instagram. I'm now starting to go watch watch them. I didn't even realize that you had this whole uh, platform, and uh, um, yeah, it's a, it's a great honor to catch up with you here, and happy to talk about some of my life experiences with uh, your followers who want to learn more about doing more today. Yeah. I appreciate it, man. Listen, you know, it's Be More Today. This whole thing came out of the quarantine. We were not thinking about doing a podcast at all. And uh, in February of last year, uh, we really started pushing this thing before the quarantine actually happened. And it's just grown and blossomed. We're a year and change now into it. And uh, it's always been about focusing on ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And, you know, um, the people who are on in the spotlight on on TV and doing all kinds of stuff, they have their own platform. But there's so many people who are doing great things that we never get to hear their stories. And I recognize that a lot of my friends are doing amazing things. So I had to bring them on the show. And you, my friend, came to mind. You and I connected again. We went to Tuxedo Park School, which is basically a K through nine school. But I got there in, in sixth grade and we shared a couple of years together, sixth, seventh, eighth grade. Uh, and then you you went away and I stayed and did other stuff. But um, we, we connected in Brooklyn a couple of years ago, and um, I just wanted to share everybody, you know, your story and what you've been doing, because I think you're great, and uh, you have so many things to share, so that's why you're here on the show. So thank you so much for being a guest on the show. Thank you, Sean. Um, so listen, we, we have a lot of stuff to talk about. I know that you um, and I went to school together, you played soccer together, basketball, kinds of fun stuff, right? Uh, you, either at your house or at school. Um, and then I know you had a fantastic chess career as well. Um, talk to people about, you know, yeah, I say career because it's a real thing. Right? <laughs> um, talk to you about your 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 chess uh, interworkings and I guess the life that happened after you and I parted. Um, after yeah, TPS. yeah. And and I was only one year ahead of you at, at TPS. Uh, I started in fifth grade. And uh, what what was nice about Tuxedo Park is that everybody got to play on the field. We we barely had enough guys to put on the the baseball field i think we only had nine right, right. so every, everybody had to go and bat and and that's where i got my sports interest and i, and I really enjoyed um being able to participate I, I am naturally competitive and it was always tough with you as like the ultra fast guy i was like oh man one day maybe maybe i could tie him at the finish line but that that was a physical impossibility um, but but then in, in high school when I when I moved to Memphis Tennessee and that I, I left in eighth grade and, and started high school in ninth grade there uh, when my dad moved there um, I tried out for the baseball team because for soccer I was too short to be goalkeeper you remember I was the goalie that let all the balls in at TPS um, then then when I got there they're like you have to be a minimum height of six feet and you got to be able to dive and touch the poles the soccer team was actually competitive it wasn't one of the best in the state and they're like we don't need this short little guy here for basketball they were the state champions so you can imagine that they sent me to the locker room and said there's there's no place for you here to dribble the ball and have it stolen stuff so uh, i tried out for baseball and um it, it was like the big leagues uh this this one guy he he hit me with a, an 88 mile an hour fastball and i was like that I've never felt more pain in my life. And I, and I was like, I don't think I can, <laughs> I can do this <laughs> at Tuxedo Park. I don't know how fast they, they threw the ball, but it was definitely not uh, like you couldn't even see the ball leave the pitcher's hand. And, and all of a sudden it hit my elbow and I, and I was like, all right, I don't think I'm going to be an athlete at this school. It, it, it was a big public school. It was very good for sports, very good academically. Um, what, yeah. White, White Station High, if anybody uh, here has ever, 
uh, dealt with Tennessee sports that they're on the grid. Um, anyway, so I said, well, I, I need to develop out a hobby that I can enjoy and, and, uh, and do as my own thing, because, uh, I was thinking like to, to go to the university, you have to have some skill, some side hobby to make yourself stand out. And I, I always liked chess. I was taught chess when, um, I was six by my grandpa. He came from Argentina to visit when my sister was born and, and he would hang out with us and he taught me chess. And my dad was a very good chess player, but he would not play me when I was little because I, I would make a mess on the board. So then later on, we would we would play casually. And then when we moved to Memphis, um, I went to the Memphis uh, chess club. My, my dad asked us, me and my younger brother if we wanted to go. And we said, Yes, and and uh, they had a tournament, and um, it was uh, it's considered rapid, like 10, 10 minutes that each person has, and um, it was ten rounds, and I lost every single game. I was zero zero for ten, and there was a young guy that was my age, uh, that was from my high school. He he was the the national champion two year of the United States among all seventh graders two years before, and that guy. He he was losing to me because he was too cocky and arrogant, and uh, and then I ended up blowing the game because I was nervous, and I lost to him, and I felt bad because I was like, I, it's fine to lose to adults, but I lost to another kid, and I thought I was the best chess player because I could beat my younger brother. Okay, and and so my my dad said, well, do you wanna do you wanna learn the game? Um, do you, do you want lessons? And coincidentally, the at the club, there was a, a Nicaraguan uh, international master, so very, very high-ranking player. Not, not grandmaster like the the world's best, but he he's much better than ninety-nine percent of the people on this earth. And he approached my dad and and was talking about teaching uh, us um, for for a good good rate because a lot of chess teachers are expensive. And this guy. Because I guess we're Latin connection, he he made it affordable, and um, and he started teaching us, and he he really taught us about how to think. Um, what what I, I me and my brother had realized is that uh, most of the kids in Memphis, Memphis has a huge chess community, like like New York City. Um, most of the kids learn by repetition. They they learn uh, the same tricks or the same ways to open the game. Everything is like copy and paste. And you would, I'd say there would be like factories of these kids all playing the same exact moves. Um, because it's very solid. It gives you the foundation, but you, you don't really know how to think. And so me and my brother were like, why do we have to play the standard stuff? Let's play different things. And as soon as you get out of the, the structure, what's called out of book, people start getting nervous. They don't know how to think. They don't know what to do. They, like their calculation was only one one move and we, we developed a much more advanced thinking. So within a year, I became the city champion. I dethroned the the other good player that was the national champion the year before. So there were two guys going back and forth. Uh, one that I saw at the chess club and then another guy, Jay, and I dethroned them. It was a shock to everybody that these two kids from New York come down. They were like at the bottom of the rank. And then in one year where we, we, uh, we're winning different championships. Me and my brother took a little bit longer to catch up because he was two years younger. So it, it, he just was maturing his brain at, at the same time. But um, my brother ended up being state champion. I never got to to do that. He he won in tenth grade the Tennessee state championship. I I was the the senior at that time, very busy with life, and and uh, ended up like third place. But but anyway, that that was the extent of my my rise to, to fame in the chess scene there in, in Memphis and and then college was very busy. Uh, I, I did play in a few tournaments. Um, I did win the Michigan Speed Chess Championship, which was only five minutes. So the, the less the lesser amount of time, the the better I am. Uh, but yeah, since since uh, basically I attended Michigan State, uh, I, I haven't played as competitively and then I moved here and I started playing recently again, um, about, about, a uh, a year ago, like a, a, right, right before coronavirus, I, I played in the city championship here and, and I'll tell you in, uh, 
when did I graduate? Like 20 years ago from, <laughs> from undergrad. Uh, the, I, I am, I'm an old dog here. I, I cannot compete anymore, but, but for me, I, personally, I, I, I want to reach master at some point in my life. I'm a, I'm a very strong expert. So rated like 19, 1950 uh, online. And uh, I want to get to 2200 and that, that requires studying again. Um, but when I, when I went to play in the first tournament here, I got smoked by some kids and I said, this kid cannot even sit like uh, with his head above the table and he destroyed me. And I said, what, what is going on here? But Austin, if, if you look at the national rankings, you'll see there, there's an, uh, a very uh, hot, hotbed of uh, very strong talent here that, that is in the middle school and all that. So anyway, that that's my, my chess career, but um, I, I like to play. It's, it keeps my my brain. It's a you know solving puzzles and keeps it active and um, and I love to play against my younger brother, but he is much better than me now. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. whenever I, I I have you seen the Queen's Gambit? Yeah, yeah. It's whenever cool. I watch that, I think about you automatically because first of all, watching that is just so invigorating and it just makes you just think differently. Could you see these people thinking about chess in a different way? And, you know, I, I can play chess, not as good as you, clearly. But um, whenever I watch that, that series, I, I always think about you and just like the, the, the capacity that you need to anticipate steps ahead of time um, and what someone may do and anticipating what they may do and how you respond to that. And just it's just so awesome. Um, and I'm sure that 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 has helped you in other areas of your life. I mean, we read through your bio, you've done so many different things. Um, and there were definitely steps you had to take to get those things done. So um, do you think there's any correlation between your, your, your chess um, experiences and the degree of or the level of things you've done in terms of your different careers in life? Yeah, I, I would say with, with chess, there, there are three things that uh, it's really helped with, with the way that I view the world. One, one is that um, it's structured. So with, with life, you, you have to you have to have kind of a plan. You know, you say, I want to be a VP. Well, you're not going to jump from right out of school to VP, right? There, there are steps along the way that you have to learn. You have to practice. You have to refine, revisit, um, you know, those methodologies. So that, that's, that's uh, one, one piece is to have structured thinking because you're, you know, you, you do action A, B, C, and it's going to lead to D, E, F. Uh, there, there's consequence for your thinking. It's helped me with... Um, setting up the, the business when I had the bakery in Chicago, um, that I, I did all this contingency thinking. So I was like, well, what, what if uh, I don't get this vendor? What if uh, I don't get this customer uh, to sign on? What, what if my chef gets in an accident? What if this, that, that? And it's all from that um, chess thinking. The, the second piece is that uh, chess is a very creative game. So like, like I was saying, you, you can memorize and come to a, a conclusion and you can keep doing the same thing over and over again. But eventually once you get to the more advanced part of the game, you, you have to think what is the insight there that will get to the victory that you have to find the path and it, and it may require like the, the title of Queens Gambit is, is like a, like a trick, like a, you 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 have some insight that that leads to to victory um and it could be through sacrifice or um or that you vision uh very far ahead and so that creativity um is how i ended up in product marketing it's how i approach uh business problems and solving them is like well everybody in my past has been doing the same thing so what can i do different that will get to a better conclusion right because if i do the same thing we're probably gonna be at the same spot or decline or whatever. So that it's that piece. And then uh, the third one is patience, which uh, you probably are like, I don't see you as very patient guy, Diego, but, but uh, you know, you, you have to sit on your hands. You have to um, realize that sometimes you just got to get through stuff to get to the other end. And um, chess really teaches you that, that discipline of, you know, don't, don't be hasty. Don't, don't try to, be too fast be accurate right like calculated and and that I, so I, I don't know if chess taught me that or that was something innate that chess made more formal in me but but 
but I, I do see a high correlation or intertwining between the two um, that that has led to my professional success and and achievements. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, that's incredible. And I do think that does have to do with um, your life experience as well. And I do think you're a patient person, you know, compared to others. <laughs> don't, don't get it twisted. Um, there's a, a certain serene nature about you still that you've had since you were in sixth grade. So um, I wouldn't I wouldn't downplay that at all, Diego. Um, so talk to the people about a little bit about what you do right now. You mentioned software marketing. Um, what do you do exactly right now in your current your current job? Yeah, so I'm I'm what's called a product marketer, and it's really the fusion of uh, product management and marketing. Pro- product management are the people that take uh, a product, and I and I work for a software company. But if you think of, uh, let's say, craft cheese, you 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 manufacture the cheese, and you need you need to figure out all the operations. You know how do you make it. How do you ship it? How do you get it to the supermarket? How do you price it? You know, the, that, that piece is the product side is all the attributes around what, what is this product that I'm bringing out to market and what's the value to the customer and how much value will they give me? And that's, you know, the price that they give. And then marketing is the, the messaging that resonates with the people that you want to sell that product to. So, you know, uh, maybe craft cheese is for people who love cheese, but maybe it's specifically people who don't want organic cheese necessarily, but want, you know, something that is everyday affordable and tastes, you know, good and consistent every day versus like other people may say, I want an imported French organic cheese. Well, those, those are maybe separate groups of cheese consumers, right? So for marketing, you have to figure out who is the person that will buy my product that will pay me the most for this product and will get value out of the product. And, and then the, the marketing piece is finding them, you know, going out on Instagram and finding who that product resonates to Facebook, going on Google and having the keywords, um, building the website, building the brochures um, that they're going to read and it's going to influence their mind. So product marketing is the fusion of these two. And um, I've had several product marketing roles. Sometimes I'm way on one extreme of marketing where I have to generate business. Like it, it's uh, very heavy supporting sales where um, you, you, you are basically coaching them on big deals and saying, hey, this is how you sell this product in and you, you, can, you can add it to the, to the whole package that you're selling. Or uh, in my current role, I, I'm a little bit more to the pro- product side, where it's more operations, also very heavy on messaging and content. But um, but I, I'm getting more exposed to future innovation, like where to take the product, how how to evolve it, what what, what needs uh, fixing. You know, um, in software, you you deal with bugs, um, so. Yeah, and a bug is just any any issue of like, hey, the customer says this doesn't work, and then you go and and fix it. So you you have to spend a lot of time fixing, but you have to spend a lot of time moving forward to stay ahead of all the startups of the competition of, of everybody. So uh, my my job at Snow is um, is is doing this uh, product marketing for a few a few products related to software asset management it's the tracking of uh, software licenses on on your computers i don't want to give too much of a plug for snow but but uh uh just for people to have context and and it's software um uh business uh, business sales so b2b it, it's not it's not something that i would sell to you sean you know as a normal citizen it's something that i would sell sell to a huge corporation that that wants to save on their license cost at at uh, their their company, right? So uh, w- let's say I, I used to work at Dell. Dell's not a customer, but I, I used to work at Dell, and Dell has a hundred thousand employees. You can imagine all the software licenses for Office three sixty five for Adobe, and and each one, you know, may cost ten dollars a month, twenty dollars a month. All that adds up across a hundred thousand employees, and so a big company wants to control that. They want to know who's accessing what how much it costs, 
Um, it, are, are there licenses that are unused? Am I paying too much? Uh, are there people that shouldn't have licenses that do? That's the visibility that Snow does. And my job is to create all that um, content and messaging to make my, my stuff relevant. Um, now, uh, B2B, the business to business sales, like selling to corporations, a lot different than selling to individuals. So most people are familiar with app, Apple, right? Uh, with craft. And it's because you go to a store, you can feel it, you can see it, you, you, you get coupons, you have offers, you have Black Friday, right? It, it, it's on TV. It's a, it's a whole different way of reaching people. B2B is a lot more driven through sales and, um, and, and then as a product marketer, you need to figure out through sales, how do I reach that end user, that, that IT manager, that nerdy guy, you know, that, that is uh, behind the scenes running the systems for, for big company, or how do I reach the marketing exec, right? Because you, you're not going to see them in the street. You're not going to see them. Um, may, you may find them on LinkedIn and you're trying to message them there, but you're not going to see them, you know, uh, in, in, a, in an easy, tangible way. So that, that, that B2B marketing is, is different. And, and that, that's an area that, that I'm in that's different than some of my peers because um, the University of Michigan is very good for marketing and it's very heavy concentrated that people go to work, you know, for craft or, or Dell, like on the consumer side or, or Apple, where you are able to contextualize what, what does that end person look like that I'm selling to? I, I can, I can see them. I, they're walking around the street. I can interview them. I can, I can uh, find them at, at big, big events, but for B2B, it's a little bit more behind the scenes. So it's very, it's very strategic um, and complicated mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, marketing, marketing uh, like the, uh, we're, we're held to maybe uh, being accountable for 20%, 20, 30% of the sales are, are supposed to come through our good efforts of going out and finding customers versus in, in uh, B2C, like uh, Amazon, like uh, where you have a website. Well, a lot more of it is going to be um, direct. Like, uh, like they, they are going to fire off an ad, you're going to click and you're going to buy. Um, and it's going to be much more visible and, and tangible. So anyway, that, I, I just wanted to give some context for people who didn't know what, what product marketing was, how it's different than like working at, at Apple. A lot, a lot of people think marketing is adver advertising um, that you just put an ad, but it's actually the whole strategy um, that advertises one piece of it, but um, the, the messaging, the operations, the sales training, the implementation, all, all of that is part, part of marketing. So it's part of what's called go to market, like the whole package of how you reach that end person is going to give you money for it. And if nobody's going to give you money for it, you don't have anything. <laughs> you don't have any work. <laughs> you're, you're not, you're not value. You know, it's, mm. So, so anyway, that, that, that's what I do. Yeah. yeah. You shared a lot of, of key points there, Diego. I had a couple um, of thoughts, you know, I, it's interesting because on a number of levels, you know, I just switched to a Mac, a MacBook for the first time in my life. I think I actually, and you oh. actually recognize this. We used to practice on computers at TPS um in the little computer room and there were a couple of computers in there there was basically a pc and a mac and there were like a couple of macs and a couple of pcs and you just pick wherever one you wanted to sit at i don't know if you remember this at all um in the middle I, of the library I, yeah exactly so i picked to sit at a pc um and for my entire life that's what i've always used i've always used a pc um and i remember using a mac maybe once or twice in that class i didn't like it so i just took the pc and i've done it for the last umpteen years right so I've used Dells. I've used all kinds of computers. I had a Dell XPS literally about for about two years, three years, and then the motherboard crashed. And my wife said, okay, we're done with PCs. You're getting a Mac. We're a Mac family. Let's go get it. So I got a Mac. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm recognizing that I'm, I'm learning how to use the Mac, uh, but I'm remembering the time TPS actually practicing on those those typewriter classes we had playing those games yeah. and how to use a computer. Now I bring this up because, you know, my job uses and most companies, right. When it comes to either therapy or what have you use uh, 365, right. And, and that's the, the you know, you use for Excel and for Word and whatever else, but I don't have that on this computer. So the license thing 
it makes sense to me because literally um, they just gave me a computer to use uh, as opposed to giving me the license that would have I could use on this computer because yeah. in their mind, that's the easier thing to do. Just give you a computer as opposed to like doing another subscription for another computer. So I, I understand that concept very, yeah, very so, well. So whoever whoever was the one that gave you that that, that computer preloaded with software, that, that person is intersecting the, this world of snow. Yeah. Right, right, <laughs> and they made right. a decision, or maybe they don't have struck, or they don't have it well organized, and and that's how you ended up with no Office three sixty five. Where you're like, great, now I can't view any documents. And right, 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 right. So now, well, the computer they gave me actually has it has some things on there, so I can do certain things, but I couldn't do them on my on my my, my Mac. I needed something else to do it on. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but I understand the concept of looking at marketing from that perspective because literally, it's funny. You know, we as therapists, and I think as most people who are professionals. If you're doing any kind of business and you're putting yourself out there in any kind of way, um, you know your craft, right? You know what to do. Like when you were in hospitality, you knew that, right? You ran that like it was your business. Um, but for most of us, when it comes to the business part or the marketing part, we're not taught that stuff in school. We don't learn those things in school. So, you know, as a therapist, yeah, I can treat anything. I can treat all day. I have no problem diagnosing and, you know, progressing and whatever else. But when it comes to marketing myself as a PT, or when it comes to marketing my own thing, or even the Be More Today stuff, when it comes to marketing and branding that, that's a new realm for me. And it, you know, it seems like your experiences with business school and even in hospitality, because there's a lot of customer service that people, you know, take from that um, to other things. It seems like all of those things um, were were put together really nicely for you to excel in what you're doing now with with snow with with marketing is that do you, yeah. do you feel the same yeah. with that yeah yeah actually the it, it almost seems like you wrote my business school essay because <laughs> because uh, you know I, I was doing a career switch um and i and i went into hospitality because uh when i when i was younger when me and you would do those field trips going to new york city for for the, the you know to go see the natural history museum and things like that I remember looking and seeing those huge hotels with like Hilton on the side, Marriott on the side. And, and I was like, Oh, one day I want to, I want to own a hotel and, and operate in that. And then in high school, uh, through the discipline of my dad, uh, throughout my life, you know, I, I was going to be a scientist, going to be an engineer. And I was like, all right. Um, I, I, I really like science. You know, it's my nerdy side, but, but in the back of my head, I was like, I, why do I need to do science to own my own hotel? So let me go study hotel management, know the operations, and then start up a hotel. What I didn't realize is that the people that own the hotels are actually finance guys that have, they're, they're playing with money. They're, re, they're like real estate guys that want to get the most out of that asset, right? They're not operators. They're not people who know how to deliver very good customer service. So anyway, naively, I was like, oh, I study hotel management. I'm going to have my own hotels to go see Diego on the side and people are going to love, you know, this hotel, I'm going to be super rich and that's going to be, you know, the, the way that I retire. Well, after, after going to Michigan state, after working a few years uh, in the hospitality industry in Chicago, I was like, this is too much. But every day that I was in front of uh, restaurant customers or, or dealing with the celebrities at the peninsula, um, I, what I really liked was, uh, the, the customer behavior, what, what you alluded to, is like the that the, there was something to observe in people and learn uh, in the customer service and what they liked and what they valued. And I was like, oh, how do I keep improving on that? How do I give more value? How do I get these people to come more? How do I get them to buy more off the menu? How do I get them to um, write that Diego was a super good manager, right, and and, and drive you know satisfaction. Um, and all of that stuff it is what I did write in my, my essays of the value uh, that I bring to Michigan, that I understand this well, and I'm really customer centric. And that, that is the essence of marketing. Marketing is knowing who you're, you're going to sell to, what value um, you're bringing to that person. And, um, and really marketing is very uh, analytical and, like that that part of the brain that's scientific you'll see that there are a lot of people that study engineering that do mba and they switch to marketing like like my older brother he was a mechanic my older brother that went to cho you know same school as you um he he was mechanical engineer and then after several years at ford motor company designing cars he went into marketing and now he's 
the chief marketing officer at Samsung. So he's he's B to C on on B to B. It's funny in the same family that that we both uh, have similar career paths, even though he's a little bit uh, higher up. But um, yeah, the that uh, that 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 piece of that I that I learned hospitality around being customer centric, delivering excellent service that that applies to products too. Um, that applies to what's called voice of the customer, understanding what what customers are giving you as feedback and how do you give greater experiences in the future. And it could be through a product, it could be through the service engagement. But um, you know, the companies that lead the world that are doing really well. They do this. They understand this well. Amazon is customer first, right? Everything's very customer centric, and and the lessons that I learned in hospitality apply to that. Apply to to anything. Now, uh, another thing that I, I learned along in my life is that I I can deliver excellent service to to you, Sean, to my friends. You know, like if if you were to come here in Texas, we we probably would would have a crepe party and and a barbecue, and, and that's like a hospitality experience. I can deliver that experience, but I, I can also deliver being a good person to other people as a manager. I can manage with them, I can collaborate with them, and I can still make their life as a marketer, as a product guy, as a sales guy, we can work together, and I can still be hospitable, like the the, the training that I had you know, to work in a hotel. I can do that in a, in a work environment, and, and you'll see that the companies that are most successful kind of have that vibe that it's not, it's not hospitality, but they're, they work well with each other. They respect each other. They, they, um, they iterate together, they innovate together. Right. And, and that, that, that happens at a very fast pace in restaurant industry, but it's, it's a skill set that you can apply other ways. You don't, you don't have to say like, Oh, I, I like delivering excellent service. I'm going to go into hospitality. No, you can apply that to HR. You can apply that to being a doctor. Right. Um, so anyway, that, that's that's my perspective of uh, of uh, yeah the hospitality, customer service, and and applying it to my my current life. Yeah, yeah. no, that's big. I, I completely agree with you. You know, it's funny, like you said, you can really apply that to any walk of life, right? Whether you're talking about physical therapy or or whatever. And I think about my job in particular, and I just want to kind of share this. It's funny because um, so I'm on vacation right now, so I'm not at work. Um, and usually when I'm not at work, my people don't come in. Like my patients will not show up if I'm not there. And I say to them all the time, look, you're going to go in there. It's the same people. They're going to walk you through your exercises. They're going to walk you through this. They're going to show you how to do certain things. My programs are on. All you do is just follow the program. It's all good. No, if you're not here, I'm not coming. And I recognize that it's nothing against my staff. It's nothing against the people that I work with, but it's a certain uh, service that they're accustomed to when I'm there, right? There's a certain feel of the environment um, that when I'm there, they want to be there. Um, and if I'm not there, they don't want to be there. And that's not for everyone, but it's for a lot of my patients. And I recognize that that's a customer service thing. That's definitely a part of the experience of being in that building, um, which can happen if I'm there or not. You know what I mean? Like it does, it's not like I'm doing anything that's crazy or magical. It's just the fact that when I'm there, they feel like they're being treated differently or more special um, when I'm there than when I'm not. And you know that, that builds well with customer service as well. A lot of that has to do with the experience, the, the connection, the interaction. Like you said, if I were to go down to Texas, you know, you'd wine and dine us like that. And it would be an experience for us to appreciate. And I think a lot of people lose sight of that when it comes to their, their crafts because they're so just accustomed and so used to just sticking to their craft and just doing it neglecting the experience that can be shared with, with the re- recipient on the other end. And, you know, I think personally, I learned a lot about that uh, working retail actually in the, uh, the Galleria in Middletown when I used to work, you know, between uh, summers and school. And, um, you know, if you've done retail ever, there's a lot of customer service that happens with that too. You know, a lot of it is just on your feet, um, working with the clients and just appeasing them in, in various ways. And, you know, a lot, I think you've used that experiences for your life in terms of hospitality and in business school, but each of us have some kind of experience where we learn how to use that, that tool, but to apply it, like you apply it to your life, I think that's the key. And, you know, I think if more of us did that for our own personal and, and professional careers, um, we'd be more successful. So kudos to you, sir. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, what you say is exactly dead on, um, 
yeah, uh, you, you know, good good leaders in in big big companies. So I, you observe them, and you're like, what are, what are the behaviors that that they do to be successful? And and you look, and and it it comes down to the respect that they show to their peers, the and and below that they, they treat them with dignity and, and they listen to them and they, the, the confidence that they show. So going back to why people are loyal to you, maybe, maybe they're like, Oh, well, Sean just has a natural energy I, I, optimism that makes me want to try harder. Right. Because you have this whole mantra of be more today. And maybe they feel some of that, you know, the natural energy and that that's, you know, in, in leaders that are, are, are effective and, and uh, they're good uh, communicators and listeners, and and all of that is like a service element to other people. Right? You, you may not be serving a, a dining room of six hundred people, but you're serving maybe a team of twenty that you're that you have to get them to be more productive. You got to get them excited and energized. Um, so all all, all of these things I, I try to observe, and from what good leaders do, and then I I look at like what I naturally do, and I try to merge them and say, okay, where my personality fits, let me put the accelerator to what is valued and driving other people to want to collaborate with me or to influence people to take on new uh, projects or initiatives um, or sometimes to be a good follower and listen to somebody else and do you know, the, the work right. But it's like service in a different dimension, but I think it's all the same innate will right do you want to do you want to do good for your team do you want to do good for the company do you want to do good for your your friends you know it's all the service element yeah. yeah absolutely um last question before the break diego you know i i i i applaud you for your marketing um uh profession and the work that you've done and you've come such a long way and i think a lot of people in marketing now have had a lot of issues in terms of um uh dealing with 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 pr Right. And, and, and how you fix things when things go wrong. Um, I think about Paul, Paul Pierce with ESPN. He's got fired from that recently for some stuff that he did. And I think about another or a lot of other things clearly come to mind. But when it comes to bigger issues, right, not so much personal, but bigger, like globally, um, we've seen this year and in numerous years, not the first time we've seen instances of hate, violence, racism, et cetera, across all different platforms and businesses themselves have found ways to respond to these certain things in various ways. Some have been very vocal about them. Um, I think about the NBA and uh, the bubble, you know, last year and putting Black Lives Matter on the floor and on different jerseys and whatnot as a way to show solidarity. Um, I think of other companies who have said nothing at all. Um, and I also think about, um, you know, companies who've been teetering, you know, putting out statements on Twitter and social media um, to appease either the masses or their employees, even Starbucks, you know, allowing people to wear certain pins on their shirts. So there have been various responses to um, the Black Lives Matter movement and even the um, the Asian hate um, that's been kind of seeping across the country right now. Um, I know you're married to someone who's of Asian descent. You have a biracial baby. Um, who now has multiple? No, no, the, we don't have a baby yet. The the baby's a dog. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> she's she well, maybe biracial, but uh, <laughs> but not through, through not through. No, we, we want it. We want a kid, and it'll probably be biracial, but yeah. or it should be. <laughs> it's the half of each of us. Hilarious. Um, but just thinking about you know your future if you do have any kids ever, right? And and looking at. Um, your life right now, what are your thoughts and how do you respond, um, I guess, from the marketing point of view, if you will, um, to all the things that are happening around our country, um, Black Lives Matter, um, Stop Asian Hate, and other things that can really disrupt the company um, if things are put out there that don't completely align with what the company stands for or what the society, wherever you may be. I mean, you're in Texas, which is very different than New York. Right. So, you know, how, how do you do from a marketing perspective? How do you respond to those things? How do you yeah. um, um, put things out there so that either everyone stays happy or that the company can stay uh, uh, level? Yeah. Well, I, I think that's a very complicated thing to actually do right, because um, I not not to not to talk bad about Dell, but Dell um, has a huge customer base. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of the the CEOs are conservative, uh, you know, big companies, right? Like the Fortune 500 companies that Dell sells 
huge amounts of computers and storage and servers. And in general, they are very particular with the words that they will put out on Twitter. Sometimes they'd let a topic go by because they don't want to deal as a business with the repercussions that come with alienating some of the, the customer base. So you, I, I personally, if I, if I were running, you know, a huge company like that, I, I would be true to my core values and communicate this is wrong and send a signal internally to my employees, you know, uh, of where I view certain issues, right. With whether it's black lives matter or this Asian hate, um, it's all about more tolerance of each other. And, and this is true for any minority faction, whether it's the Muslims a few years ago that were getting targeted or or even the LGBTQ community that has some stuff happening and, and states that are going against them, you know. And, and, I, and I do feel that corporations, because they're so intertwined with the way that the society works, even though we may not observe it, but, you know, there's a huge amount of donations they do politically. They, they are the ones that get these corporate tax breaks or they can influence the way a lot of the government decisions or what we observe on TV, you know, that the Senate and, and Congress are, are deciding on. Um, they can step up. And I, and, I, and I am dismayed that more leaders haven't um, stepped up, right? You hear from certain exceptional people who have a point of view and say, this is wrong. And they will go and say something like the Salesforce CEO, um, Jamie Dimon, even of Chase, surprisingly, will say stuff that he doesn't agree with. Delta and Coke came out recently about the, the voting issue in, in Georgia. Um, McKinsey, I know, is very proactive with, uh, they have a whole thing. Uh, I saw an article on the Asian hate movement. They interviewed their own employees about perspectives and they put a, a, a well thought out article there for people to engage with. They did the same with Black Lives Matter. But um, so there, there's some companies that, like you said, they, they will go do it, but I think it's very few and, and it's very disappointing that they're not more being active uh, or, or controlling this, at least behind the scenes. Now, in the case of Dell, like I, I know Michael Dell will send a personal message to his employees, but it's internal. It, it's, not, it's not external. He's not, he doesn't want to disturb the waters because he knows that there's a huge base that may retaliate, sales may drop, and then the stock goes down, right? And then that impacts, so your 100,000 employees, maybe the stock performance goes down, sales go down, and then you have to fire people. So that they're, you know, it, it, that's why I say it's complicated. It's not, it's not so easy to be just because you're saying, I'm doing this on a principle. I want to communicate what's right, but then maybe 50% of your sales drop. And then you're like, what? well, great. I did what was principle, but now I don't have a business anymore. And, and that, that is, that is tough. But for me personally, I, I don't really trade those, those values. I say it, and it goes back to knowing your customer as you develop the product and you have good messaging about who you are and what that product means to people, then you're going to have certain values and say, I represent fairness. I represent uh, equality for everybody. I, I think uh, men and women should get paid equally. So that, that might be in your charter as you're developing as a business. And then your customers that'll resonate with them. And they're like, Oh, I like that messaging. I like this company and it ties to my life. Right. But for other companies, it, you know, that have evolved in the hundred-year-old companies or thirty-year-old companies, that gets farther away, and their their mission and goals, you know, are more global. That they have to be more encompassing of everybody, right? And everybody may be people that you don't like or disagree with. Um, so that that's my view from a corporate messaging PR point of view. Like from marketing, typically we as individuals are not allowed to speak on behalf of the, the company and saying, this is of you as me, as an employee here, uh, Starbucks may, may be more tolerant because that, that is a culture that they, they have that top down, you know, we, we embrace everybody, but, um, but in general for marketing, uh, we try to acknowledge the issue and, and like uh, I know in my last job, when, um, at UST where we had black lives matter, there were, there was a concentrated effort to have messaging go out that so that talked about solidarity, 
talked about the the need to hire more diverse candidates and and become a more diverse. So there were these initiatives being pushed down, um, but but that's like one off, right? It, it like so so there there are activities that we participated to, to do that like one off, but long term projects, long term messaging around it. There are only a few companies that can do that successfully, like Nike, maybe, right? That that can that can pick because they they tie so closely to to different cultures within within the U.S., right? But for other other companies, yeah, you you kind of like put a, a bandaid there and say there there's my Twitter post of solidarity, but then what happens the day after? So so for me, these are issues always in the back of my head. And I have to juggle, you know, and you know what, what, what is, what is acceptable for me to say, and, I, and usually I will post on my own social media away from the company because I don't want any association and backlash. You know, they said this employee at this company now we're gonna boycott or uh, like I get them in trouble right for for saying stuff that I I perceive as liberal and progressive, but you know half this country is not. So so you just gotta watch out for how you say stuff. And that's why I'm very careful with attacking people on, on their opinions because you never know <laughs> how this uh, can come back and, and attack you as a personal attack. And then you're like, I was just doing something that I believed in was principled. And yeah, you, you may be viewed as a hero to some, but you may also screw yourself up, right? But that, that, that's me as a, I'm not a, I'm not an activist. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a guy who, who believes in right and wrong, and I will talk bad about you know one one side uh, at home, but I, I'm not gonna go and and be extremely vocal and go and champion this stuff, and then ha- have to deal with all of the the I'm kind of coward like that, yeah. But <laughs> but uh, but uh, anyway, you know, I think a lot of people are, are afraid of well, uh, if I say what I truly believe, I'm gonna get all this this backlash, um, especially the, you know, the, the more that your career advances, the more that you end up intersecting other circles, you may not want to lose business partners or people that may hire you or people that may commission your work. Right. So yeah, I I think all of us going back to just general, uh, tolerance and understanding of this world. Um, you know, it would be great if everybody, could relate with each other, treat each other with respect and, and dignity and say, you are a human on this earth for your 100, 120 years. We're going to have a good time together. I'm going to treat you with respect. I'm going to treat you as a human. You're a global citizen. You have the right to live and enjoy the life here on earth as a, as a creature here. And, and you know, let, let's work it out to to coexist right and um i i don't think people in the heat of the moment you know there are a lot of external factors stress and you may not uh you yeah you may act in a way that is not nice to somebody else uh, you know whether it's asian or or black or hispanic or or whatever because of information that you've been fed in your head, of the groups that you hang out with, with the way that you get information. I, I think a big a big part of the problem with what's going on is this misinformation that people go on Facebook, they see a video, they don't necessarily check where that video came from. They don't ask the right questions like, what was the purpose of the creation of the video? Who is the person delivering the message to me? Like, where did this come from? And you get the wrong thoughts in your head and then you start thinking, oh, these people, this group of people are like this and they're here to ruin the whole world. And maybe it's not reality. It's somebody made it reality because they put that video in front of you, but it's not, it's not the truth, you know? And, and I think right now between uh, the US and China, um, it's very complicated because there, there are government groups and other intelligence groups and people behind the scenes that are creating content that is affecting the way that we perceive this world. And it may not be reality, but it's to put thoughts in our head. And um, yeah, I, I just am in cost of that because I, I think a lot of the content that, that flies 
I'm more on the or much more on the left side. So I, I, I'm cognizant that the content that I see is going to be to, to say like the more conservative side is bad or doing bad things. Look, look at all this, right. It's to get me riled up and, and, but I know from my conservative friends that they get these videos that I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but they believe like, Oh, you know, like these crazy thoughts and, and, it, and, and those videos, the purpose is to get clicks and to drive this divisiveness. So whoever is the architect of that stuff is doing a good job at getting us isolated and, and nervous about the other side. And, it, and it's us as the viewers that have to be smart enough to back out and say, these are my values. This is where the video stands at those values and either supports or goes against. And then I'm going to validate, you know, is that is that truth that I'm being told, right? It's very easy to manipulate the mind. So anyway, my 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 view about the the racial injustices that we observe is like you got to look at yourself and say, am I being good to other people? Am I am I treating them with respect? Is this the way that I would want to be treated? You know, the other way. And then as you get messaging that may conflict or support what you're saying, you got to say. Is how's that? Where's that message coming from? Who's delivering that to me? Do I even know the source, right? Because there's a lot of fabricated stuff now, and and uh, driving people to to make wrong conclusions. So anyway, that, that, that's my short answer to <laughs> uh, to what's going on right now with, with the world, and and from a marketing lens, how how do you talk about it? Yeah. Mm. Thank you for sharing that, Diego. I really appreciate that. Quick fire questions, and I'm gonna get you out of here. Listen, you just shared all that stuff, right, about um, the world. But if there's one thing that you could pick to make the world a better place, what would that one thing be? Uh, it may sound kind of commonplace, but uh, it, it, I, I really believe in universal health care. Um, I think that uh, my my father-in-law he he was diagnosed with uh, liver cancer a year ago, um, and things started to spiral quickly out of control from the, like, what, 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 where's our future? My, my wife's family lives in China. She, she lives here. So is she going to have to move back? Is she, who's going to take care of him? Who's going to pay for this medicine that comes from the United States? That is like the ultra best cancer uh, medicine um, that costs a hundred thousand a year, you know, that, that piece. And then, uh, Recently, one of one of my friends here in Texas that is around my age, uh, I, I think he's close to forty, maybe younger. He he has liver, uh, not liver. He has um, intestinal uh, colon cancer, and he has this GoFundMe page. Like he basically threw all his money at at surviving, and then now you know, he's going to have more costs because it's not covered by his insurance. He, he had a good job, you know, and I, I'm like, why, why is it fair that you throw all of your money, your whole family throws all their money for survival? Is that the best that we can do in the year 2021 as humans that you go totally bankrupt? Because if he, if he, if he makes it through all this treatment, he will, he will have no money at 40 and then what does he do? He has to work another 40 years, like to, to put money aside. And, and th these are two recent examples, like really close to me, but I, I just think we could do better there because uh, it's something that is, it doesn't matter how rich or how old you are, health could go sideways. And then that's the end of your fun here, you know, on earth, the, you know, everything and it affects your your family, your friends. You know, and at a certain point, you just run out of resources and money and time, and you say, "I can't do anymore." And you, and then you feel guilty, right? You, so anyway, that's that's my what I what I would do is let, let's get it so that everybody has access, and we have so much intelligence with AI and and advancements in medicine. We, we there's no reason that that you go bankrupt, uh, you know, from health. Yeah. Last question, Diego. Uh, be more today is my mantra. It's my thing. You know it now. Um, when you hear the phrase be more today, I ask everybody on the show what it means to them. You're number 56. So when you hear the phrase be more today, sir, what does that phrase mean to you? 
Yeah. For, for me, it's really about improving the satisfaction of, of your life. And it, it could be that you want to make more money. That's a common, common theme. It could be that you want a better job. You want a better boss. Um, so you're always like in this pursuit of, of better. It could be that you want to raise, raise, stay at home and raise your family, right? Maybe you as a father, you've been working. Your wife also wants to work. You have a kid. Maybe she continues working. You, you stay at home. Um, but it's about defining what you want out of your life. It's your life. You, you're here for the 100, maybe 150 years for our generation. I don't know. But, but you're, you're here for a relatively short time on earth. You need to get the value you want. If you want to, if you want to drop everything and do a startup, do that, and and then start building the processes to to get on that track. If you want to take a three month break from work, take a time out, you know, go visit your friends, go do that. You want to write a book, um, and that, but it has to be what is driving satisfaction in your in your life. Don't. Don't get caught up with, I have to work. I have to, I have to do this because I make so much money, right? It's about living a purposeful life, being good to other people, spreading the goodness. um, And, and, uh, and having a, a a life that, that is worth, worth living, right? It's about, about purpose and and that, that's where I say improve the satisfaction of your life is 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 what be more today is is uh, and it's not just like instant gratification it's about it's about what what um is that higher level Maslow hierarchy of of uh of being that, at least that those, those are my thoughts for today <laughs> well said sir any final tips you want to share with listeners about anything you shared today, marketing, um, about chess, about anything that's related to anything that you, you've learned or that you're doing right now in your, in your current profession? Uh, I, I will say that in, in life you have ups and downs. And you, you can see from my career that I went from one industry to another industry. I had that bakery in the middle that caused a lot of ups and downs. Um, I've I had a lot of uh, challenging experiences uh, professionally um, to get to this point. And my advice is that one is be persistent. Always keep trying, keep your head in the game. And I think you would appreciate that as an athlete. Like you, you may have a, a setback out of the, the gate running out or, or you may trip up or you just weren't feeling good, right? You get back. You keep trying. And the, the second one is always ask, always ask, like whatever, whatever you have on your mind. If, if you think you deserve a promotion, ask. If you are negotiating, you know, a car deal, ask, can you take $500 off, right? If you don't ask, you won't get it for sure. <laughs> so, but, but ask, and, I, and I'll just give one example that with, with my bakery, with my doorman in uh, Chicago, he, he, one time asked me uh, how, how much you need to get this business going. And I was like, I did a quick calculation. I was like, 25,000 should, should get me like six months of capital and it should be good. And a week later he gave me the check. And I never thought that this guy who was the doorman of my building would just cut me a check. But he's like, I worked 40 years at, at Ford. I'm retired. I have um, pension 401k. I have, uh, millions of dollars. I don't have any kids here, you know, go good luck with your business. So I, I, I always say, keep, keep that mentality that ask, don't keep asking the same question over and over to the same person, but, but it doesn't hurt, you know, and, and that's, that's uh, where you'll get support or you will get other people that, that, uh, re- that the message resonates with, but yeah, you know, it all starts with the, with the first question can you do this for me or do you have this or can you help me? Yeah. Wow. That's a crazy story, Diego. Thanks so much for sharing <laughs> that. And uh, wow. Hey, where can listeners follow you, um, learn more about you, either on social media or otherwise? Yeah, they, they can follow me on Instagram, uh, DH Cepeda, or 
Um, they can email me, dhcepeda at gmail.com. And Sean, I don't know if you can write that out, uh, D-H-C-E-P-E-D-A, but for, for the, the audience. But I'm, I'm very happy to help with anybody that wants life advice, career switch, just wants to talk. <laughs> um, yeah, anybody who heard this podcast and found some of my stories insightful or, or you know, me want to need a job and need help with their career, they can talk to me. Yeah. Awesome. Thank awesome. you, Sean. Great catching yeah, thank up. Thank you so much, man. You made episode 56 perfect. And it's been so great catching up with you. Really appreciate you, man. And uh, you too. Folks, again, the quote from today is very simple. Make the most of yourself by fanning the tiny inner sparks of possibility into flames of achievement. You heard him say it. He lived a life that was uh, progressive from the beginning to the end. And he's mixed so many things together to be where he is now. So uh, follow his story, if you will, and continue to follow Be More Today. As always, again, we're everywhere at be more today.com for my book, our podcast, music, everything else related to Be More Today. And if you want to send us an email, be more today, number two day at gmail.com. Again, the Word for Life podcast comes out every single Wednesday. Check out boy T. Farrell every single Wednesday. And we will be here every single Monday on Be More Today podcast and on YouTube. As I always say, have a good day. Have a good night and have a great life and continue to take your steps to be the best version of you. We'll see you next week. Peace.